Hello everyone, welcome to Ask Concussion Doc, episode number 28. Uh, today's episode, we're actually going to do four questions. The first one talks about fencing responses. Uh, why do they happen? What do they mean? Um, and kind of what's the pathophysiology uh, inside the brain? Uh, body impacts. So uh, this question is pretty general. Body impacts and concussion. What's your point of view? So I'll talk a little bit about biomechanics uh, and how a body impact can lead to a concussion. Um, the third one is on chronic concussion. When is a concussion actually considered to be chronic? There's a few definitions of this and so we'll go into each one uh, just to help you as clinicians figure out when your patient is now considered chronic. And the fourth one is fatigue management. Uh, fatigue is part of most brain injuries, but for how long and when is lasting fatigue still not due to injury? This is one of the most common symptoms we see, particularly in people with persistent concussion symptoms. And so we'll kind of dive into that as to why, when, how, where, what, who, that type of thing. Okay, so first off, we have an announcement. Uh, if you haven't signed up yet for Concussion Chronicles, this is a monthly newsletter where we actually send all the research that's been published for that month. We send you an update of the top two or three studies from that month and we kind of break them down. Uh, we also give our interpretation and kind of tie it into what we currently know within the medical literature. So rather than just an abstract it's a full-on summary of the articles as well as our commentary on it and again how it ties into um, existing literature so the next issue is going to be released first week of december and so far the the two of the three articles have been selected this is how current the evidence is we haven't even picked the third article yet but the first one is on the chicago blackhawks test a study that was published uh, by us here at complete concussion management and in that and if you sign up this week for that and you're you, you're a member for the december issue you're going to get a full copy of the blackhawks test paper um, concussions and suicide there was a huge systematic review and meta meta-analysis that was done this year to look at the uh, risk of suicide following concussion injuries and so uh, we we've included that one as well uh, as that's a very important topic with concussions and the third one like I said we haven't really even decided what it what it may be so if you haven't signed up yet for concussion chronicles you can do so at complete concussions uh, and it's one of the links uh, along the top and you click you sign up and you get an email every month with uh, the most important research of that month in the concussion space Cool. Okay, so first question, fencing response. What does the fencing response tell us in addition to positive concussion? Of course, well, the fencing response, for those that don't know, is indicative of a loss of consciousness. And it happens in up to two-thirds of loss of consciousness cases where someone is hit or rendered unconscious for whatever reason. And what happens is their arms go rigid even when they're on the ground. So their arms will go up, maybe just one arm, maybe both, but the arms will be kind of extended straight up in the air as they're kind of lying on their back uh, on, on the field. Now this is a telltale sign from the sidelines that there's been a loss of consciousness. So even if you're doing sideline management and you see somebody get knocked down, but you see those arms up in the air like that and they kind of gradually start to fall back down, uh, that is what's called a fencing response and that indicates that the brain stem was involved in the actual injury and so um, they're not actually sure what the exact pathophysiology is behind it but they believe it involves the vestibular nucleus within the brain stem that causes that type of uh, response um, anyway yeah so that's just a 100 percent indication that there's been a loss of consciousness and also a 100 percent indication that there has been a concussion in terms of recovery and all that stuff loss of consciousness doesn't necessarily predict concussion recovery times and so uh, it doesn't necessarily have any impact on the injury itself or how that person is going to recover uh, at least from the evidence we have currently body impacts Body impacts and concussion, what is your point of view? So concussion is due to acceleration of the brain within the skull. You can have a concussion from a hit to the head because obviously the easiest way 
to have a significant acceleration of the head is to be hit directly in the head. But if you get hit in the body with enough force, your head is going to whip back and forth and that, that acceleration or deceleration is going to transmit up to the head. And if there is enough force transmitted up to the head, you can get a concussion. So concussions can happen with body impacts, and you'll see this often in sports like football, rugby, hockey, where the person will actually get hit in the body and they'll get up off balance and they'll be diagnosed with a concussion. And so it's it's almost kind of this whiplash type mechanism that moves the brain inside the skull and creates the same injury, same pathophysiology, same process as if you were hit directly in the head. I, I've known of people that have slipped and fallen and landed on their butt and the force translates up and they, they get knocked out unconscious or they fall on their knees on a hard surface and get knocked out unconscious. So you don't have to be hit in the head to cause a concussion. So body impacts can also cause concussion. So the kind of rule of thumb here for people, and I know this is one of those things that coaches um, of sports will still think, well, you didn't even get hit in the head. You don't have a concussion. That's actually not the case. The rule of thumb is if you get hit anywhere in the body and there's enough, it's a, it's a, a significant impact and you start experiencing any one of the concussion-like symptoms, headache, dizziness, confusion, nauseousness, etc., that is grounds to be very suspicious of a concussion injury. Okay, next one, chronic concussion. When is a concussion considered chronic? There's actually two main diagnostic criteria for this. One is actually from the DSM, and this one is version four. We're currently on DSM version five, and they've actually removed post-concussion syndrome from their diagnostic criteria. But nonetheless, the DSM four criteria often gets used. And what that is, is having three or more concussion symptoms beyond three months from the injury. So that's the DSM four criteria is three months after injury still having symptoms. The other one is the ICD-10 criteria, so that's the International Classification of Diseases version 10, and that one is four weeks. So that one is having concussion symptoms, three or more concussion symptoms, uh, and they categorize them, so there's like sleep category, there's different categories of the symptoms, but basically it's three or more symptoms at four weeks or greater from injury. Now the question is which one of these classification systems do you use? We use the ICD-10 criteria and I'll tell you why. After a concussion, well concussion causes an energy deficit within the brain. Most of the evidence in humans has found that that lasts anywhere from three to four weeks. So that's kind of the metabolic recovery time zone um, for humans as far as we know anyway. Beyond that period, we don't really have a good clear explanation as to why people are having ongoing symptoms. And it could come from any one of kind of the five categories of, of persistent concussion symptoms. Some people say six. Uh, we just go with five because we've condensed some categories. But it kind of fits with the timeline with the four weeks. So um, the way that Berlin has structured it actually is that they've considered symptoms to be persistent – so they're calling it now, rather than post-concussion syndrome, the terminology has kind of changed. So the new terminology is persistent symptoms. And Berlin, which is the international consensus statement, considers symptoms to be persistent in adults at 14 days after injury and in children at four weeks after injury. So that kind of fits with the ICD-10 criteria. So technically, in my mind, you're not considered chronic by definition until four weeks but we start treating you as if you are chronic at 14 days and in some cases even earlier now so for example doing uh, exercise testing treadmill testing a vestibular and ocular motor uh, rehab and then starting in with uh, treatment of the neck and getting you on a diet plan I think we start that uh, as early as 10 to 14 days because if we don't well, you're going to just continue down the chronic path anyway, and we're going to see you at week four, and you're still going to be symptomatic. And so generally, we have these two kind of camps where your symptoms are gone in the first 10 days, and your recovery is quite speedy. But if your symptoms are still there at day 10, then we kind of start intervening at that point. 
So kind of a convoluted answer. By definition, it's four weeks. Clinically, we start treating it as if you're chronic at 10 to 14 days. All right. I'm just whipping through these today. <laughs> okay. Uh, fatigue management. Fatigue is part of most brain injuries, but for how long? When is lasting fatigue still not due to injury? So um, we talked about concussion being this energy deficit. So in the early phases after concussion, because you have this massive drop in ATP production versus ATP usage, you burn more ATP than you're creating. And that results in this negative energy deficit uh, in terms of, you know, brain energy levels. And so generally that's a main symptom of concussion is fatigue. People want to sleep a lot. They don't really have uh, a lot of energy and they get fatigued quite easily when they start doing either physical or cognitive tasks. Now, as I said, that energy stores tends to recover itself in that three to four week timeline. So beyond that, you know, why do we still have fatigue? There's a few possible reasons for this. So this is actually quite a big question. Um, let's go, let's go first and foremost. Um, just the, I don't want to say the psychological piece of it, but just the, the, the management side of things. So the way that concussion is typically managed, managed is that we tell patients to sit in a dark room, don't do anything, don't use your brain. You know, this is what we used to do in the past. We don't do this anymore. But what does that do? Well, you get used to not really using your brain, not really doing a whole lot, not doing any cognitive activity, not doing any physical activity. And so now you're kind of getting yourself out of shape. And that's kind of what I, the way that I um, explain it to people, or the way that it kind of makes sense to me is that you're getting yourself out of shape because you're not using your brain to the level that you used to. Now, when you try to go back to that, it's exhausting to you. It's more than you're used to. So, for example, if you're a, you know, you're a marathon runner, you run a lot of marathons, you do a lot of, you know, running and things like that. All of a sudden, you take a few months off running. Could you just go back and run a full marathon right away? Probably not. You'd probably have to go back a little bit earlier and start slow and build yourself back up because you've gotten yourself out of shape because you haven't done anything in two or three months. So now it's the same thing when a person is describing fatigue and then you ask them what their day to day is and they basically just lie around all day, they sleep, they do a little bit here, a little bit there and then they try to go back to work and they are fatigued within the first few days or the first few hours. Well, is that because there's something still going on or is that because you've deconditioned yourself so much that now getting back into activity is difficult for you? So that's one possibility. Another possibility is there's other things that happen within the brain, such as blood flow abnormalities, which we can test for with exertional testing and things like that. And we can rehab actually with exercise, but you have to do this in a specific manner. So if somebody has some sort of blood flow abnormality or some sort of uh, autonomic nervous system dysregulation, they can experience fatigue earlier than someone who doesn't. And so if that's the cause, we can easily test for that and then kind of get you back into things as you go. And there's a specific protocol to follow to, in order to do that. The other possibility for fatigue, an easy fatigue ability following concussion, is that you have two main cognitive kind of systems within your brain. One is called the default mode network. The default mode network is the kind of self-talk that's happening within your brain when you're kind of just daydreaming, right? You're driving and you're going, okay, did I do that? Did I take out the garbage? Did I do this stuff? What do I have to pick up from the grocery store? Your mind is jumping around place to place, no real kind of method. You're not really focused on anything. You're just kind of, you know, doing your kind of self-talk and thinking about random things. That's default mode network and that's the default setting. You also have your executive network. When you're in an exam, you're focused, you're writing your test or you're doing a, a, a task, you're writing something out, you're really focused on what you're doing, that's your executive network. In a normal person, in a healthy person I should say, not a normal person, but in a healthy person, you can only have one of those systems activated at the same at, at one time. So if you're focused on something, your default mode network shuts off, your executive network takes over. If your executive network is shut off, you're now in default mode network. So you're either operating with one or the other. 
Research on concussion patients has found that they often have both networks activated at the same time. So things like fMRI studies and things like that will show that both networks are activated. So when you're giving somebody a task uh, and they're a concussed patient, not only will they potentially perform poorly on that task because they got all this other stuff going on at the same time, but they're also going to use way more energy, way more blood flow, and get fatigued a lot sooner than if they were just using one or the other network, right? So you're almost doubling up the amount that's going on and it makes it difficult to focus and it also burns um, a lot more energy. So that type of thing, and I just wanna kind of throw in the caveat of that, is we also find the same patterns in people with anxiety. So anxiety will create that. When you got so much going on, you can't focus on your task and they often find it's the same thing where you have both networks activated at the same time. So people with generalized anxiety disorders. And there's often a ton of overlap between people with persistent concussion symptoms and people with generalized anxiety. The symptoms are very similar, the conditions are very similar, and oftentimes when you're not recovering from your concussion, you start to get a little bit anxious about it and you develop a furthering of your entire clinical picture. And so it kind of complicates the whole thing. So those are the main reasons why fatigue may be present in concussion. You have to figure out why it is. And so if we can lower the anxiety levels, we can help it. If, if we lower the anxiety, we improve your sleep, which therefore reduces your fatigue. If it's a blood flow issue, we put you on the treadmill, we run you through these specific protocols, we give you the appropriate rehab to do, uh, and, and that starts to improve, right? When you're exercising, you get more energy and, and all these things start to kind of happen. And then secondly, by getting you back into activity early, by not letting you take a whole bunch of time off work, by slowly building you back in, right? Getting you back to your marathon, you know, not going in, jumping in all at once, but saying, okay, well, let's try an hour first. Then let's try two hours and three hours and four hours. And we build you up to that. We can mitigate some of the effects of the fatigue uh, that you are currently suffering. There may be more in there that I've missed, but those are kind of the main ones that, that strike me first. Anyways, thank you guys for joining us. This has been episode 28 of Ask Concussion Doc. Uh, again, go sign up for Chronicles if you haven't yet and uh, get research every month. See you guys next week.